and uh, welcome to the second Watch Moths. And this one is, oh, this one's so exciting because there is poetry, there is augmented reality. I couldn't even believe we'd be doing that six months ago, but anyway, augmented reality. And then there's the stars of the show, all the real moths themselves being attracted to the light, part of a project that is called Moths to a Flame. So tonight we are actually seeing the moths come to the flame. And um, so first of all though, I want to welcome you and also uh, say thank you to our funders for this evening, which is the Arts Council National Lottery Fund and also to Plymouth Energy Community. And they're two partners, We've actually got quite a lot of partners that are supporting us at the moment and their names will pop up during the next hour. So it's a really full hour. Uh, hopefully it's all going to go to plan and hopefully you'll all enjoy it and relax and be amazed at times. So I'm going to just introduce Art and Energy a little bit, just, just for those that didn't come last time. Art and Energy Community Interest Company, or we're a collective of artists, makers, technologists, um, all sorts of people with skills that are passionate about making renewable energy more aesthetic, creating artworks with children and with adults that fix the sun's energy um, like this one here this was made with children when we were working with them to talk about where energy comes from and also beautiful aesthetically pleasing laser cut artworks like the one that chloe is next door to there making some energy from the sun that, that's landing on the artwork. So it's not only beautiful, it's also useful. Um, we, we want more people to understand uh, the energy system in the world as well as nature and how it's all interconnected. And so Moths to the Flame, to a Flame, is not only about moths as a fantastic, beautiful creature, it's also about its strange attraction to light and how humans on the planet is also attracted to light. And in fact, we're all here watching light and <laughs> enjoying, enjoying the thought of why, why are we doing that and why are moths doing that? So Moths to a Flame is a project that we thought of uh, a few months ago, six months or a year ago, and this was at the Plymouth Illuminate Festival where we started thinking about having a mass participation art installation where, where thousands of people would create flying moths um, that glowed in the dark, that would create a sight and a thought about the creature and the energy use. We're really supportive of renewable energies and we also want the, the world, the community to understand the nature. What's the, what's the next slide, Jenny? Is that it? That's us, yes. So that's just, just a quick introduction into what uh, art and energy do and what the Moths to a Flame is about. Our, our main goal over the next year and a bit is to create this mass participation art installation and take it to Glasgow in 2021 when the United Nations Climate Change Conference COP26 will be happening in the UK for the first time. So we now are going to have a little word from Claire the, from Plymouth Energy Community. Welcome, Claire. And we need to unmute you. Can you? Are you unmuted now? 
Oh. Am I now? Yeah, yeah. sorry, that was me. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> we got there in the end. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the second Moth Watch that we've had. Um, Plymouth Energy Community is uh, supporting art and energy to help people get more hands-on with the energy system. It can be such a dry topic and actually with um, talk of climate action and uh, targets, carbon reduction targets being so hard to reach, uh, there was a sense that people felt a bit lost and a little bit hopeless and, um, and disenabled rather than enabled to take part in that. Um, and we've been working along with Art and Energy now for, I think it's probably two years, isn't it? It's got to be two years, if not more than that, actually. And it's been an absolute delight. And you watch people, and I include myself in that. I'm no tech head. Uh, but to start to get your hands on the technology, the renewables um, that are being developed and playing with them. The, the, one of the clips that you've just seen, it was, um, it was a picture and it was you, Chloe, and you'd got, uh, you just plugged in your solar artwork. And I don't know if you remember it or if you can go back to it, but the joy on your face, of just being able to plug it in and you're creating your own energy and you've, it, it, it's beautiful. And that's the sort of glee that we're seeing in people. And that's what we want to encourage. So the messages that we want to send to COP26 are, are of hope and of a willingness to participate and an understanding of what our use of energy does to nature and the environment. Um, so thank you all for coming and do take part. I'll, I'll be recording my whisper of hope. My daughter has been uh, AR moth colouring cinnabar moth she's gone for today. Um, and, and please do take part. Have fun and enjoy yourself. I'll, I'll hand you back. That's enough from me. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Claire. And thanks for your support. So first of all, we'll have a wave from our various presenters. We've got, we have Jenny, who you've already met. We've got Chloe there waving. We have Matt, our poet, Matt Harvey. He's here somewhere, but not on my screen, but hopefully he's waving. And then we have Amy, John, Will and Simon, they're all our presenters. Can you, can you see them all? <laughs> I'll wave as well. <laughs> okay, so um, welcome to Watch Moths. And now I think our main activity can start. We're going to initially go with Jenny doing the augmented reality uh, moth that we've created and then we'll be moving on to our presenters and to the poetry and you'll see it'll all flow like magic but we'll hand over to Jenny now. <laughs> oh, it's not letting me come over to me that's where we're going. There you are. Okay so hopefully you've now got me on the screen. Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry, for some reason it's asking me to rename myself, but it's not letting me spotlight my own video, but never mind. Um, so um, behind me, you can see a picture of the, uh, the exhibition that we held last November um, in Ocean Studios down in Plymouth at Illuminate Festival. And we absolutely loved working with so many different people to decorate their moth. Um, we, we put together the exhibition with Plymouth Energy Community Support at fairly short notice and we weren't sure how it was going to be received um, and we didn't make enough moths for people to decorate we were, we were madly making moths for, for more people to come and decorate um, with the black marker pens and the uv uh, uv paint um, and and people were really engaging with this um, and we were so excited about what 2020 had to ho and hold for us and then of course we all had this this huge surprise sprung on us with covid and um for a little while we sat and scratched our heads and thought we, we really don't know where we're going to go with this. Um, and then we decided that we needed to do what a lot of other organisations were doing and to, to nudge the project to have a bit more of a, an online presence. Um, and I had come across something called Quiver Vision with augmented reality colouring sheets through something that my children had received from the Woodland Trust. And it kind of stuck in the back of my mind, but I didn't think it was ever going to be within our budget or within our, our ability to do. Um, and then we, we talked to the Methenji community about it and they got fully on board and, and agreed that it was, it was best to do something while we could. So um, this is a video put together by Ali, who's part of our collective, uh, and myself and a whole bunch of, of 
willing volunteers. Um, so hopefully I can press play and uh, this will give you some idea of what an augmented reality colouring sheet is. Next year, world leaders and scientists are meeting at COP26 in Glasgow to discuss the future of our planet. Art and Energy will be there with an attention-grabbing installation called Moths to a Flame. We're using technology to create a magical display of digital moths that will tell these leaders our hopes for the future. And that's where you come in. Did you know that the word to describe a group of moths is a whisper? We need you to join with us to create this artwork by adding your digital moth and recording your hope for the future. The more moths we can add to the whisper, the louder our voice becomes. To join in, just print and decorate our moth colouring sheet and then bring your moth to life using the Quiver Vision app. Record a short video of you and your moth, then share it on social media using hashtag Moths to a Flame. The Moths to a Flame project will show the world that we want change. We want to be kinder to our planet and reduce the threat of climate change. The more moths we collect, the more voices we hear, the more powerful the message. So grab your colouring sheet from artandenergy.org and help us to make our whisper roar. My hope for the future is that we can find ways to work creatively together to be kinder to our planet. So hopefully that's got you all reaching for your colouring pencils and your colouring pens and getting excited and engaged with, with what it is that we're doing. Um, that video showed a handful of, of youngsters doing it, but really it's open to everybody. Um, over the last few years, the, the whole mindfulness, colouring, uh, slowing down, being creative, um, I think we're all beginning to realise the value of that to all of us in our lives. Um, and so please, please share it with friends, family, um, if you're able to record the, the video clips and share them using the hashtag moth to a flame um, or email them to us, then the plan is that we're going to take these video clips and photographs and combine them to create a digital artwork. And as Naomi was saying, the whole idea is that we want to be able to take this with us when we go up to Glasgow and um, engage with people up there, in particular people who are up there for the climate conference for COP26. Um, I've got another little short video clip here that I'm going to pop on. Um, and this, I'm going to talk over the top while it goes. This is all on our website now. So um, just before the session, you will have had uh, an email with the colouring sheet. But actually, if you go onto our website, um, you'll see on the, the main page that there's uh, Moths to a Flame and there's then underneath that ways to get involved in this project. Um, this video is on there along with some uh, longer instructions with some hints and tips as well down the bottom to help you to make the most of your colouring sheet. Um, in some ways it feels quite scary, the whole technology side of things, um, but actually Quiver Vision, who we've been working with to create this, have done a brilliant job of, of making it very accessible so long as you've got a, a mobile phone or a tablet a device with a, a digital device with a camera um wi-fi access wow. my hope for the future is that we can find ways to work creatively together to be kinder to our planet and there's also on the website if you're not so into the coloring side of things um, there is also a button over to the right hand side of the screen which will enable you to record your hope, to, hope for the future without the visual side of things. So um, please feel free to do a bit of both or what have you, um, just get involved and, and please share it far and wide and get lots of people involved. It would be lovely. I'm going to pass back over to Naomi now. Hey, that's fantastic. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you. I haven't seen I haven't seen that uh, video properly like that and it's, it's great. Um, we're hoping that it's going to result in those. In fact, we set ourselves this target, which might be a bit crazy, but 20,000 whispers. 20,000 whispers of hope from all over the world, but especially in the UK. 
from the southwest up to Glasgow. So now we're moving on to moths and and why moths end up in moth traps um, by being managed by experts and why they collect them and why they record them. So we're going to move over to Simon and Will who Hello. are in Exwick. Hello Simon and Will. Good evening the world and um, welcome I'm Simon Bates and I'm, this is I'm Will Scott and you can see that we are a well-oiled machine yeah, tonight. We're, we've definitely practiced. <laughs> <laughs> we've not practiced or have we? <laughs> It's completely this is, live. This Anything is ad can happen. Yeah, yeah, we're ad living. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm on holiday because I live a mile away uh, in Exeter, and I've come over to Will's place tonight. Um, and I'm running my trap in a Devon Wildlife Trust reserve, uh, Whitcomb Valley Park. Beautiful place. Uh, do go if you've not been there before on the northwest side of Exeter. Yeah. Stunning views across to the estuary and the cathedral and also really good habitat so um hopefully yeah. good things from my trap really over there um and basically i've got into moths in the last sort of 15 years so i'm a relative novice tonight also i i mean you can tell i'm a novice i had to buy this t-shirt was will has actually made his uh -huh. um, it's fantastic will what's on it what's that moth it's a pyroster purpuralis which uh -huh. is a <laughs> For anyone, I think it's got an English name, but I couldn't tell. It's a type of mint moth, perhaps yeah, in yeah, English. Yeah, yeah. I only know the scientific. P purple and gold it's, mint moth. It's it's very punk, and I I like my punk. So I thought, what what a great way to express yourself in moths. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, I think you should, in the end, by the end of this series, perhaps we'll all be in our t-shirts and moth pictures. <laughs> But what uh, have you got there then? What have you got in that place, in that garden? And I might just operate the camera a little bit, but um, yeah, yeah, Will, Will can tell you all about how he's got into moths and... Oh yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> okay, so hello again, I'm Will. Yeah. I got into moths, well I'm in my mid-30s almost now, believe it or not, but I got into moths about 25, 30 years ago almost. Um, through my dad back in Hampshire and we used to do the moth traps together in the garden and I think my first moth memory is being in the garden or in my house and my dad shouting be hawk be hawk be hawk and like I was a birder so I was like what it's not a bee eater it's not a sparrow hawk what's <laughs> going on I don't know what I didn't understand what was happening I ran to the window I looked down at the honeysuckle and there was a narrow bordered bee hawk moth uh, nectaring and that kind of just ignited my passion for moths from then on, and here we are 25 years later or more. Um, and I'm in my back garden standing with Simon talking to you about moth trapping. So, right. yeah, a lifelong passion, really. Um, and and I, uh, I was just uh, saying to Will that, that my dad's a potter, um, so we didn't have, I didn't quite have, that's, that's the excuse <laughs> I'm going to give, but I didn't quite have the, uh, the grounding in moths or ecology from the from being, <laughs> being out of the pram you know yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> um, moths for life that's what i say so um i'm going to talk a bit about moth trap but um i think really first i want to talk about moths and like why they are so attractive um to me and probably to everyone i think because if you like colors which i think is most people if you like patterns which is everyone then you know, if I can show you stuff like this, I don't know if you can see it. Look at that. It's a little broad bordered yellow underwing and it's colors, it's patterns, it's shape, it's form, you know, it's everything. And, you know, I think that appeals really to everyone fundamentally. Um, and that's why I love moths, I know, is because they're beautiful and so valuable. The more I learn about them, the more I realize that it's not just about beauty, it's about function and the value that they have you know, not just through their beauty, but, you know, through their ecosystem services, um, like Ooh. pollinating, which when I say pollinating in ecosystem services, I mean, you know, pollinating our crops, making seeds for birds, being the food for birds in the spring, just Absolutely. the list is endless, isn't it? Absolutely. Just endless. Essential. I won't Essential. bore you with the rest of it. <laughs> we'll talk about the moth trap. Um, so I run an actinic moth trap. People call these actinics because of the lights, they're actinic bulbs. Um, and what happens if you're a moth 
say I'm my hands are moth doing moth stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm flying around and this light is casting upwards. Um, as you can see, um, when I put it down, it's coming up. So I'm a moth. <laughs> yeah, oh well, God, <laughs> looking for a female, badly looking for a female. Um, and uh, so they see this light and some people think that it mimics their, their response of like a female moth. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of science that says that the bright light and insect eyes, it makes the light itself looks like a black hole. Yes. And because they want to fly to the darkness, they fly straight at the light. And, and so they fly at the light, hit the light, hit the side and uh, drop into the middle bit like that so once they're in there they'll fly around be caught and hopefully they'll rest till the morning on uh some egg boxes which i pop in it mimics you know like the bark or a leaf or a bit of leaf litter or whatever they like to rest in they'll uh, find their appropriate spot have a and sleep they, and they don't they don't sort of you, when you were saying they get they hit the light and then they hit the side and then they drop down makes the poor little moth sound a bit damaged. They're not damaged, are they? No, no. So when you're as light as a moth, you can hit something pretty hard and do no damage whatsoever. Okay. Whereas if you're a human, we're a bit heavier. So we imagine ourselves hitting that thing at that speed. And obviously, yeah, we, we're going to probably do ourselves a bit more damage. But yeah, they're, they're always unharmed. And what we're going to talk about now quickly is what I do when I open it, which we'll see tomorrow morning. But this is like, this is the sort of evening after the morning before, as it were. And a lot of people just like shake their egg boxes off into a bush. Um, so remember I said that the moths are like roosting on these egg boxes um, in the morning. And I take these egg boxes out, as you'll see tomorrow morning when you tune in. Um, and I then place these egg boxes in a box. I mean, pardon the branding. You're going to have to just forget branding. Um, these are organic moths. Um, but I pop them in there. Alive, I should add, and I pop that on the top, and then I pop them in a hedge or a tree. And um, what that means is that at night they just fly out the holes when they want to. You see, they just go out and do what they want to do rather than me deciding where to put them and then getting that place wrong. And then maybe a bird finds them, or a mouse, or I don't know, something else, a slow worm. Yeah, whatever. All the enemies of the moths will find them if I if I try and be a moth. I'm not a moth. I can't think like a moth. So <laughs> I, I just I leave I leave that to the moths. So a lot of people ask, oh, do you hurt the moths? Do you harm them? But they they're never harmed. You know, we, we do this because we love moths and we respect respect them and want to appreciate them. So we we keep them alive, make sure they're all happy. That might we might be up on time there. Sorry. I mean, we have. We We've got one one question, Simon and Will. What are the sticks for? The stick that you're just popping back in, Will. Yes. Go for it, Will. So I'm I'm a bit I'm a bit of a side I'm a bit of a curveball here, and I put sticks on the edge of the traps um, to encourage the moths, especially micro moths, to rest on them, um, and they'll that they'll stick around the traps in the morning uh, rather than flying off and finding somewhere better to roost um, that's in the light. Um, and then when I come in the morning, I can, you know, take photographs, have a look at them, put them in a pot if I need to identify them, which we'll see tomorrow, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's an extra bit of habitat, really. Hopefully tomorrow morning, there'll be something really cool roosting on one of these sticks and I can prove their value. And <laughs> I, yeah. thought, I thought they were there to put a little bit of plastic over the top to protect the light. So that, that's oh, good. Yeah, these, these bulbs run cold, these actinic oh, do these they? So they don't, it doesn't matter if they get wet, so that's quite that's handy. Good. They're the ones that... And the plastic wrap around there? The plastic yeah. wrap, for <laughs> anyone who owns cats. Uh, well, at night, this is often what your cat's doing, I'm afraid. It's, it's making... <laughs> I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't come across that before. Yes, but that, that thing that you said about, we've got one minute, so that thing that you said about um, moths' eyes and how they look at, they, they might actually see light as black and see it yeah. as... Well, when, when we've been working at Exeter University, um, the research people have been researching moth eyes and they say that the surface of them are covered in, in little pimples, that they're rippled. And 
and they don't quite know why but they know that they're very light sensitive and they want to mimic that in in the way that they make solar cells and mm. And one of the thoughts is that these little ripples or pimples actually in wet weather, they, it collects the water and it, it actually enables them to carry on functioning whatever the weather, but nobody particularly knows it's a mystery. It sounds almost like it's increasing the surface area that light can hit by having the ripples. Maybe it gathers a bit of light or something, I don't know. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, we it is amazing. So, so we're learning most of the most Ooh. important research that that scientists are doing like that is is based on research, on mimicking what nature already does. Yeah. So, so you know that's that's good. I yeah. reckon. But um, has anybody got any more questions, Jenny? No. Nope. Um, yeah, we've just got um, Gabby's just asked whether it's possible to see underneath the trap and what about the rain was that what about the, the rain what about, what about the rain and may she see underneath okay that's just a, a sturdy box there it yeah. is have, made, have you got holes to to drain the rain out or anything yes it, it drains out like around the edges the the wood itself has a slight gap so ah. it can drain water finds out as as i'm sure we all know um from paddling pools it always finds um. <laughs> and its way out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Thanks very much, Will and Simon. We're looking forward to seeing you in the morning and may well during the rest of the time now because there there may be some other questions you don't know yet. We'll be here. So, um, we will thank you, and we're now going to move on to our poetry with Chloe and Matt. Hi, I'm not sure whether you can see me. Um, uh, Naomi, can you see me? Hello? Hello, I can see you. Yay, I can I see, see you. you. Hello, Matt. <laughs> so, um, I'm Chloe, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Art and Energy Collective. And um, I've actually been thinking about energy and art since about 2012, because I trained as a puppeteer and as an illustrator, but then I landed up working in the energy sector and in the renewable energy sector. And I was trying to find a way to, um, to express some of the feelings and ideas that I had about energy, um, which were that uh, renewable energy is amazing, our energy system is amazing, and um, how can we engage people in something that most people, well, some lots of people, according to Smart Energy GB, 78% of people in the UK think energy is ultra dull. And I thought that that can't be right. It can't be possible that people think energy is dull. So um, I started in 2012 thinking about art and energy and where those things intersect and looking at practice of artists from all around the world. And that's when I started thinking about Matt, because um, I came across some of Matt's poetry. And what I realised quite quickly was that he was finding different ways of talking about things that I thought I knew something about. And he was funny and gentle and generous and also quite insightful. So. I invited Matt to come and spend 18 months as poet in residence at Regen, which was the renewable energy company that I worked at. And uh, we explored the renewable energy sector. We went to events and we went to visit different energy sites and we thought about our relationship with energy. And Matt, in his genius way, um, developed a whole range of wonderful poems which we compiled in this lovely book called The Element in the Room, Poems Inspired by Renewable Energy. And the reason why I wanted to have them in a book was because I wanted anyone who wanted to think about energy in a new way to have a place to go to just take a different perspective and have and you know, enjoy energy in a different way. But what Matt and I quickly realised 
was that there was no last word in um, in talking about energy. We got to the end of the project and I immediately thought, but we haven't said everything. This is still really exciting. There's more to say. So I persuaded Matt to work with our friend Thomas Hewitt Jones to produce or to write something wonderful in my backyard, which is a community musical that tells the story of a group of people who are trying to respond to the energy challenge and they develop a project together. And that was very exciting and wonderful. And um, we had a lovely performance of this piece. Um, but unfortunately, lots of things got in the way of us being able to take this further. So the refugee crisis became something that lots of people were talking about. And the school that we were working with, they closed their arts department. And so there were lots of things that stopped us being able to keep going with this project. So if you know anyone who wants to take up the challenge of making a community energy musical, then this is this is a great starting point. Um, now, Naomi and I collaborated in 2017 and 2018 in thinking about what art and energy might look like outside of the realm of uh, working with Regen. And Matt was one of the first people that I talked to about what that might look like. And basically strong armed him into becoming part of our collective. And I'm very pleased that he did because I've spent many years really struggling to find words to talk about the things that I'm passionate about, art and natural world and energy and trying to respond to the climate emergency. And Matt has a very clever way of doing that. Um, so Matt, I wonder if you'd be happy to talk about the Moths to Flame poem that you've written and your experience of writing poetry um, to do with renewable energy. Right, yes, thank you. Uh, of course I would. Um, yes, because I, I started looking and thinking about um, energy as, as pretty much the same time as Chloe. When Chloe got me involved in the, um, in the Regen residency that, that ended up with, as, as with the element, element in the room. And I, in a way I've been thinking about it before as a as a as a young man, almost unimaginably young, I went to the Centre for Alternative Technology in Machuntliff, and it's kind of been sort of percolating around me ever since. Um, and so I found it. There's something about re renewable energy, in particular, that emotionally is just so blindingly, obviously right and wonderful to me, and sometimes expressing the blindingly obviously right and wonderful even when you're a seasoned poet is just impossible and you have to zoom in on tiny little things and sometimes you have to find negative things to to talk about in order to be able to say and isn't it wonderful um that you have to do all these little kind of um contortions and and um strange yeah re reshapings of yourself in your mind um i wanted to talk though about going into the Moths to Flame project, having been you know, in and out of the energy world. And the, my introduction to it was kind of through Chloe. And I think I talked to Naomi too, but, but Chloe could, was, gave my introduction to the concept of um, what felt like a teeming thousands upon thousands. I think you're, fi you're fixed on 20 now, but thousands upon thousands of moths in, in a enclosed in space, all of them with beautiful, handmade, homemade patterns and messages and their unique idiosyncrasies. And they only become visible when they're shone, uh, when, a, when a dark light torch is shone upon them. And so my inspiration for the poem was not just moths and not just light and energy, but also the artwork itself, the installation itself, or my understanding of the installation. And so what we're meeting is what, what, what come, all come together in my poem is my very limited understanding of moths, the artwork that um, art and energy are making, and uh, energy. And I don't understand any of these things, but I have tremendous enthusiasm for them. No, and so when you, have, when you have energy, when you have 
enthusiasm, but not much knowledge. The best thing to do is to make it rhyme. So that's, I'm, shall I read the poem now? I think I've, uh, okay. We've, so this we've is. Got, we've got a version of the poem that you did. Oh. Which is, which is a videoed version of the poem, which we yeah. can, which we can show. That's what would be a really nice thing to do. I've never seen it. Um, no, I know, this is a new thing for you and for all of us. Jenny, are you happy to play it? There is a whisper in the air, invisible yet everywhere, as dormant in the quiet night, a thousand million points of light who bask in dark, not asking much, await our need, our dark torch touch. The dark of night, the perfect frame to set the spark, the gleam, the flame. Each moth's ultra-absorbent eyes are trained upon the flickering prize. In crazed, self-sacrificing flight, they spiral in on heat and light. Flustered, fluttering, foolish moth, we're like you, cut from the same cloth. How easily we flick a switch to strike a match to scratch the itch to bring the flickering quick and close. Each day a larger, stronger dose. What drives us to this self-affliction, hunger, habit, deep addiction, careering toward the neon bloom, delirium, delight and doom. The light-crazed moth does not want saving from its kamikaze craving, while we, in ours, somehow must learn to change trajectory or burn. We've tasted power. We are in thrall, we're at the hunger's beck and call. We apprehend it's out of hand, but transform, we don't understand. As grubs that inch along a leaf can barely summon the belief one day they'll fly, so likewise we scarce grasp the possibility, improbable, unlikely thing, that flame may yet be drawn to wing. Beyond the other side of strange, that they might switch we might change. Nice film. <laughs> Wait, yeah, Lauren's done a very good job in making that film, hasn't she? Yeah. Um, poor Matt, I dragged him out into the into to a verge in the middle of nowhere and <laughs> made him stand under a street light <laughs> to read it. But thank you very much, Matt. That was Really lovely. Right. I've never seen it. I had to hang on to that street light, otherwise I'd have just fallen. <laughs> I was going to keel over at any point. Um, Matt, you talked about um, not knowing, and I think that that's a bit like what it's like trying to respond to the climate emergency and trying to do anything in this world. I don't think any of us know what we're doing or how to do it. And that's one of the reasons why making art is such a wonderful way to explore and understand more what do you think i completely agree i think i think that's it's something that w i have certainly been I've got quite down in the dumps about things because I, I didn't quite know how to respond and i think finding any way to respond making something immediately sort of lifts one's spirits and the sense of participating in something is in is you know going um right at the beginning our, our friend talked about feeling disenabled and making something and participating and making something has instantly the opposite effect and gives a sense of optimism and possibility even when we don't know all the steps that lead to where we want to get to the key thing is to be taking steps i think um and we find we kind of find our way as we go um we're talking about not knowing i had no idea that moths are seeing in the light a black a black hole they're heading towards a black hole <laughs> Who knew? I, didn't <laughs> I didn't know that either um, but one of the things that, um, one of the poems that you wrote that I hope you might be happy to share with everyone um, now is um, a piece about personal transformation called Pupus, um, which has got a reference to Pupus Soup. The butterfly which, poem. The butterfly poem, which is, the, which is about, uh, as I understand it, it's a piece about um, um, what it takes to transform and what it takes to become. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I just want to say, what, what I love about the project that, that Art and Energy are doing is the way that we're looking at moths, not just as a metaphor, 
but as these wonderful creatures in themselves from which we learn scientifically as well as kind of emotionally and you know in terms of aesthetically and, I, and this particular poem was inspired when I was really all at sea personally by a visit to Buckfastley Butterfly Farm where I actually read on a poster that when the caterpillar pupates inside its chrysalis it breaks down into a liquid state into soup before metamorphosing into a butterfly uh, which is it said a universal symbol for psychological wholeness and that's kind of what inspired the butterfly poem I thought you can't stay a caterpillar forever, not even if you're a caterpillar of the community. I thought you've not yet passed your metamorphose by date, it's time to move on, it's time to pupate. And so I wove myself a self-catering chrysalis, protective outer casing composed in my case of fixed habits, stock phrases, um, trademark mannerisms, and an easy automatic affability, prepared for pupation, mutation, emotional promotion. After a while, I wondered why, instead of firming and toning and turning into a wholesome butterfly, I began to disband, to droop, to liquefy, turn to soup. I went into a crisis in my chrysalis. I looked around but found no emergency cord to pull, no glass to break, no antidote to take. You can't halt the progress of metamorphosis, not when it's a metaphor for a deep core process. It is the norm among those who would transform to experience temporary loss of form. Before they can regroup, your ingredients must revert to soup. You must submit, surrender your solidity. There's no biological or legal loophole. You go out of your salad days into the soup bowl. Helpless as when you arrived in the cradle, you're up soup creek without a ladle your pooper soup. And though there's little cachet or social status in being a little sachet of oceanic stardust, on the side of your pooper soup packet you can honestly say nothing added, nothing taken away. In our case we become alphabet soup, ourselves letters encrypted in code, interred in an unpronounceable word. And as our constitution is rewritten we become a variation on a theme, a reinterpretation of a half-remembered dream. And I trust as we recover that sense of who, of I am, there shall emerge a singing cabalistic anagram. Poets in translation with the inescapable sensation that here, at the intersection at the top of the spine, here where antennae and two wings converge shall be words glistening wet with the primal soup slime in the beginning meets dearly beloved meets once upon a time that's lovely and and <laughs> very good and and now i think chloe we've sort of run out of poetry oh, yeah, but, we have time, but are we able to invite people to um, respond poetically to our challenge? Yes, and at the very end, we can also remind people, and there might be time for another little poem, but I think we should go, you do that, and then we'll go over yes. to the boss. So, Matt, you and I um, have explored poetic stuff without knowing what we're doing, and our invitation yeah. is to everyone that we're um, we're inviting to participate in this project to do the same. Um, we are launching today a poetry competition, the first art and energy poetry competition, where we would like to invite people to contribute their poem, um, uh, which will be judged, with the deadline of which is in uh, September and will be judged by a Zoom event hosted by Matt in November. So I'll share details in the chat a bit later and um, we might get so much time, Naomi. No, 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 you got it fine. It's it's all it's all cool. But I I need to take us take us to our other lovely mothers. So so we we are now going to fly from Pat, Matt's wonderful poetry. Fly over to Amy to see some of her caterpillars and other such Whoa. things. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. All good, right, hello everyone. Thank hello. you very much. And yeah, following that, Matt, what wonderful poetry. Just really enjoyed that. I really love the different turn that tonight's um, session's taking. Um, it's just brilliant, thank you. Um, so I'm Amy, I'm Amy Walkden. I, I live in Abbots Kurzweil and I've been um, mothing for a couple of years. And I'm very fortunate because I happen to have met a couple of 
brilliant people and who also live in this village um, who've helped me along the way really I just sort of decided I wanted to know more about them had a his, you know interest in the natural world anyway and thought and so got my father-in-law to um to build this trap which is very similar to the one that Simon's using I've got it on already because it's quite dimpsy tonight and um uh, we, you get moths that come at dusk and others that come in the sort of dead of night so it's always worth turning it on a bit earlier and see, seeing what you get so really I haven't got much more to say about the um the trap itself but I can show you some caterpillars if you'd like to see them um yes not quite well turning to soup some of them actually um for anyone that tuned in to the last session you may remember that I showed you some buff ermine caterpillars that were quite hairy and very lively um anyway that they're not there anymore they, they've they've they're not wriggling around they're somewhere turning to soup in in the compost now they've they got to a stage where they decided they had enough to eat and um sorry there's a bit of reflection there and they've burrowed and sort of spun webs of, out of leaf matter and bits of compost around themselves and there they will stay until next spring when they'll emerge and um turn into this type of moth here buff ermine so hopefully any luck. And in the meantime, I've got some new additions to the caterpillar household at the moment. I'm just going to bring this over here. Where's the big one? Hmm. Right, it's a little game here. Spot the caterpillar. Can you see these absolutely whopping green chaps here? Oh, yeah, amazing. I, th I thought I thought that was part of the leaf. <laughs> yes, well, they're, I mean, their camouflage is wonderful. They're, but they're very cryptic. That's this is willow, a willow. Um, I don't know what type of willow exactly, but they seem to like it. It's just up the road, and I keep pinching bits off and heading out with my scissors. And and there's four on there. Just see them there. One, two, three, four. Now these are the caterpillars of the poplar hawk moth. And um, I'm going to turn my camera around so you can see a picture of what it will look like next spring. These ones will also burrow. Um, in the compost quite soonish, I think some of them are getting quite big. I'm just going to flip my camera around. This is what they will look like come May, hopefully. Um, oh, how big are they? Well, I'm going to just give you a little bit of size reference. Just a second. Yeah, yeah. Next one, sorry, slight technical problem here. Hmm. I'm gonna go back here. Here's one, this is my daughter for scale. She's five. <laughs> they are pretty big. That's one there. Yeah. They look like sort of crunched up leaves. They're not the biggest of our hawk moths, but they're, um, they are pretty big. I'm gonna turn you around again and show you another. Second. So for size comparison, I've also got these little ones, um, which are much, much smaller. Can you see those? Quite yeah. similar looking, but they're um, a lot smaller. And they've also got this sort of spur on their back, on the end of them there. Um, and these are, they're going to get a lot bigger. Um, and these are the caterpillars of the privet hawk moth, moth, which is our largest. And I know we certainly had them last time. And I'm going to just show you another picture of what this is going to look like when it grows up. Um, around again. Now, again, that's wow. Robin, my daughter's hand. So <laughs> it's big. But they're, they're, this is our largest. I mean, it's more like a little mouse, really. I mean, it's just enormous or, a, you know, bat size. Um, another image here of her holding it, but um, they are, I mean, they're, they're just absolutely splendid. They're, um, and <laughs> they're the most sort of glamorous, I think, of the moths and you, and one always hopes that, well, I always do anyway, as a relatively new moth that you, you know, if you get, if you get a hawk moth of some kind in there, then you, you know, it's, it's good stuff because um, a lot of them, when you first start out, just look roughly the same. I mean, they're kind of brown and there's some splodges here and there and, you know, if you're lucky enough to have the experts in the village of whom you will meet all being well tomorrow morning, Barry Henwood, who's um, actually our Devon moth recorder, then 
he can give you the eggs if you're lucky enough. And that's why I've got the caterpillars here. And, um, and he can you know, teach you a lot more about, about them. And, and of course, the wonderful books as well that, that, are, uh, that he has written or been involved in. Um, and you can find out loads more. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if you really want to learn about moth, I think you should just have to move to Abbott's Curswell, really, because it seems to be the place that everyone... Um, yeah, well, it, it seems like there's, there's Abbott's Curswell, there's, um, there's up... Up near Dartmoor with John, yeah. and there's yeah. down here next week with Simon and Will. Quite, <laughs> quite a lot of moth experts at the moment. Absolutely, yeah. So that's it for me. But as, tomorrow morning, um, really, we'll have Barry here. He has a, another trap, different, slightly different to mine, and I've never known him not have you know loads and loads in there, and it all gets very exciting. So um, if you're up and awake, then tune in at eight o'clock tomorrow morning and see the big reveal. So yeah. looking forward to it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, and we um and last of our moth experts is John in Buckfast. Yeah. Hello, John. How are you? How are you doing today? Uh, it's very well, thank you. Yeah, I've been uh, up, up all hours and out all hours this week. So uh, yeah. Well, it um, seems to me that this, for for um, moth specialists, well, entomologists and natural historians who actually do this work for a living this is your busiest time isn't it or is it all oh around? yeah yeah i mean really between end of march and october is all pretty busy but yeah particularly well particularly when the weather's good uh, so really bit of this week i've been out all over the place i get up about half five and get back about seven yeah. um so uh, yeah it's all pretty busy and i've got a whole bunch like amy has i've got some caterpillars as well and if you'll be able to see these um very similar. I've just put a light on there so you can see. I'm going to get up to the camera there. So this is this is uh, similar to the poplar hawk. This is an eyed hawk moth caterpillar. Um, wow. As you can see, it's quite an impressive thing. And, and like the poplar hawks, uh, these will feed up. You know, see, it's about seven, eight centimeters long at the moment. They'll get a little bit bigger than that, and then it will go a funny colour and it will burrow down into the ground and then it will stay as a pupa right through until next spring. So uh, that would be exciting. And then, and then where do you release them, John? I just let them go where I found them. Well, in fact, with these, the little trick I have is um, these, the, if, you, if you hatch a female eye hawk, and you do this the same with your poplar hawks, Amy, um, if you get a female, um, what I do is I stick her out somewhere where I know there are eye hawk moths um, and I put her on a tree in the evening and then she'll sit there, she'll produce a pheromone scent and attract a male overnight. But with these and the poplar hawk moths, the pair remain mated right through the next day. So I can go back the next morning and usually find the pair mated on the tree. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they'll remain mated until the evening when they'll split and fly off. So it's a great way to actually see them. Um, and yeah. you can just put the moth out. It seems like you're letting the moth go. Um, but as long as it doesn't get eaten, um, yeah. It will uh, it will be there mated with the male the next morning. You can do it with, with lots of moths, things like puss moths and and a lot of these big hawk moths as well. You can do that. Oh. And I've got, um, as I say, I need to get up early because I've got a menagerie of all sorts of insects. So it sometimes takes me about an hour to feed them all. And get oh. them to sleep. <laughs> yeah. um, I've got this. You have I've a whole found. load of pets. <laughs> it is, yeah. I mean, I don't. I'm not into cats and dogs, but I've got lots of uh, lots of insects. Yeah. <laughs> you can see this here. Um, I'm going to get that to the light there, the light on it, this, can you see that? Oh yes, yeah we can that see is that. That is the chrysalis of the hummingbird hawk moth. Oh wow. And uh, well, I had one, I had a hummingbird, there's been quite a few hummingbird hawk moths around lately and I had one laying eggs in the garden, but also uh, I know a little spot down at Exmouth where you can find the caterpillars, so I went down there and I found a caterpillar. And that's just changed into a chrysalis, and that that won't overwinter, so it will hatch in a couple of weeks, and then I'll let the moth go in the garden. Oh. So yeah, so um, I've they're, got a, they're really magic, aren't they? Those oh, ones. fantastic! Yeah, I mean, I mean, when you catch moths and you see the moths in the trap, it's only a tiny bit of their life cycle, really. Uh, mm. The caterpillars and all the early stages are, to me, actually more interesting, and in, in, in in many ways because it is. It's how they spend, some of them spend the majority of their life really. Uh, the moth bit is a little bit at the end um, and yeah. they disperse and mate, but to actually spend most of the time as a caterpillar or a chrysalis. Well, that, that's an interesting thought as well in, in terms of 
in terms of the science, but also in terms of the art and thinking about, you know, creatures life cycles. Yeah, well, it's always amazing. I mean, never, it's amazing that that there. Yeah, that's pretty well full grown. So everything you need to make that beautiful eye talk moth, all those colours and patterns and those wings, is all inside there. But you would never believe it, would you? That's it. That, 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 it's like it's uh, mashed up into a whole load of soup in the process, and then it reconstitutes into amazing structures, complex structures, eyes, wings, legs, and then it can fly. So that caterpillar is just has been there. To, uh, to make them off. It always is, it never ceases to amaze me. That. Yeah. And, and then those eyes, those complex structures of eyes, yeah. uh, picking up on all the light. <laughs> you know, that's right. Yeah. A whole I mean, caterpillars of can, caterpillars yeah, I mean, can detect light as well. So, um, uh, because I do occasionally get caterpillars coming to moth traps, and um, obviously they take them so long that they probably be <laughs> there you know, by the morning. So, but yeah. you do occasionally get, I don't know if they're attracted to the light or what, you sometimes get that sort of the traps. No. Well, thanks. Thanks, John. We have actually reached our nine o'clock. We've spent a whole hour. So, and, and I know that your knowledge, it's like Will started when he was five with his dad. You, you started at a really young age as well, haven't you? Yeah, I started at five, yeah, as well. Yeah, so maybe that's a magic age. What about Robin? Yeah. Amy's daughter. <laughs> yeah, with any luck. Yeah, hopefully she'll be she'll catch the bug. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> well, thanks very much, John, and right. and Amy, and Will and Simon there, um, and Matt with his beautiful poems. Um, Chloe, do you want to before we go off? Chloe, do you want to just remind people about this? competition and maybe what people could do during the night if they want to. Yes, thank you. I've shared a link to the details for our mod competition, but what Matt and I are hoping that we'll do is just to start us all off, I think that we'd like to experiment with crowdsourcing a poem tomorrow. So we'd like to invite everyone to find a word or two or a phrase that is that um, we think about when we think about um, moths or energy and hopefully in the chat box we can create some kind of uh, crowdsourced poem um, in the morning. Yeah so so let our imaginations fly then and get attracted to a twinkle in the night. Yes I wonder <laughs> Matt, do you have, Matt do you have a word of advice for people? I would just say um, whatever words come to you write them down don't judge don't judge it you're not you're not having to write the whole thing just words that have some kind of sparkle or magic or meaning for you or nearly do or ask yourself what would you whisper to a moth okay that's a good thing to ask all right well we'll come back in the morning and we'll put put it down in chat or send it to us art and energy in some other way but Otherwise, um, that's the end of our hour's thrilling entertainment, which I hope that you've all enjoyed. It's been, it's been um, great to be able to launch our Augmented Moth, and it's been fantastic to hear the poem for the first time performed on film, um, as well as listening to the poem about the butterfly and the pupa and the soup. Um, so, I hope you all sleep well tonight and we're due to meet again at eight o'clock in the morning to have more real moths from those caterpillars that we've all enjoyed seeing and we'll see you then hopefully. So bye bye everybody and thanks to our presenters. You're fantastic as always. We couldn't do it without you. <laughs> bye bye. All right, I'm going to stop the share there. And just have a quick look in the chat to see if we've got anything else coming through. But otherwise, it's the same login details for the morning um, to come back to us. And if you do, uh, if you're struck by inspiration in the night, then please email it through to us um, or save it for the morning. And um, as Naomi says, 
if uh, you get around to decorating your, um, your quiver sheet and you're able to record a video, then again, um, emailing it through to us at hello at artandenergy.org or sharing it on social media using, yeah, sorry, using the hashtag moths to a flame. And otherwise, we'll see you in the morning. I'm going to end the session now and we'll see you all. Good night. Good night.